if you look at the towers of the contemporary city in a surrealist frame of mind, you see not modernist structures, but phallic embodiments of the ego, desire, and the will to power. But how to reach that state of mind? Well, if you doodle without paying attention to what you're doing, you may be surprised by the beauty and the originality of the results. And this was a key method that the Surrealists used in writing, drawing, and painting to free the mind from the cage of rationality. They called this method automatism. André Breton said that automatism, which is really important as a kind of central aspect to surrealism, is the operation of the mind freed from rationality. Artists began to take up this idea too. André Masson drawings, for instance, very beautiful automatic drawings he does, where the hand just seems to guide itself and create these very cursive flowing lines and out of the lines, these figures emerge, nudes and birds and fishes. Juan Miro adopts a quite different style, one which is much sparer. Miro was one of the most famous surrealist painters, and for a time, anyway, especially in the mid-twenties, he was making work which was manifestly surreal. Miro would have us believe that this painting behind me, which is just called Painting, 1927, uh, is an automatist work. He says that it was done, uh, or the works like this were done, in uh, prolonged trances, sometimes brought on by hunger. So his conscious mind is apparently not at work at all, and this is an automatic image, and thus it's purely surreal. But sketchbooks have since been discovered, in which preparatory drawings for these things um, exist. Now, the drawings may well be automatic in some sense. I mean, it's, it's hard to tell. There's, there's no way really to say one way or another. And it's certainly true, too, that uh, the paintings quite carefully copy elements of the drawings. So you might see this painting as a kind of transcription of automatic drawing. This mirror is a very spare and simple painting. It has a blue ground, a large white element, uh, and some black lines and little coloured pieces, many of which are rather hard to identify. Miro himself was asked about them in later life, and so he says that the white element, for instance, is uh, like a, a, a dummy circus horse, you know, the kind of horse that would, was, uh, you know, would have um, a figure inside it and a trailing white, white gown to represent the horse. And then there have been interpretations of the black line that surrounds the horse as being the circus master's whip. But one feels that this, these sorts of interpretations tend to flatten our reading of the painting. And certainly if you look at what Breton says about automatism, there's freedom on both sides. There's certainly the freedom of the artist in order to create these works. But there's also freedom for the viewer to creatively imagine their own personal interpretations. And for also for these forms to metamorphize as that happens. Rationality cannot encompass them. You can only grasp them by surrendering to your unconscious. But this isn't pure romanticism because it's also backed by psychoanalysis. And in particular, the Freudian view of the way in which symbols work in dreams. And one of the things that Freud says very insightfully is that very often in dreams, one symbol will stand in for more than one thing. A figure may appear as a father, but may also seem to somehow have elements of the mother or something of that sort. But of course, if you can make an ambivalent symbol, which embodies the two at once, then within that symbol you also have that surrealist poetic charge. The surrealists are fascinated by psychoanalysis, but they want to use it arguably in rather anti-psychoanalytic ways. So for Freud, 
the purpose of understanding the mind is in order to control it, to protect civilization from madness, even the madness of war, perhaps. The surrealists don't want that. They accept much of what psychoanalysis says, but what they want is to liberate the unconscious, to make it free. And that's certainly the way in which Breton would like to see uh, psychoanalysis operating. So not as something which is of any utility to anybody, uh, certainly not something which can be geared towards curing mad people. Rather, uh, we should be enjoying our madness and cultivating it. One of Breton's most famous statements is that the purest surrealist act is to run out into the street and to fire a revolver at random into the crowd. And he says that those people who have not embraced surrealist values, who are tied still to hierarchy and rationality, deserve to be hit by those bullets. This is indeed an act of automatism. It's a much more violent one than we see in the mirror, but it is. It's an act of automatism. He's not saying that you fire at any individual person or anything like that. You certainly don't aim. You merely allow your subconscious to direct the bullets where they will go. And this points to a surrealist romance with violence, in a sense, that they're certainly into liberating uh, their sexual desires, but also their desires for uh, violence and domination, too. Those are part, after all, of the unconscious. So there's a certain way in which surrealism might be thought to have been writing blank checks for barbarism in the 15 years before the Second World War breaks out. And when that barbarism uh, is really fully developed and revealed, especially through the Holocaust, but uh, in all the um, appalling acts and consequences of World War II, it seems that surrealism doesn't have anything very convincing to say about that. In the 1920s, the Communist Party is quite powerful in France, but at the same time for mainstream opinion, it is a scandalous, dangerous movement. There's a point in the uh, late 1920s when Breton and other members of the Surrealist movement decide to join the Communist Party, and they indeed become fully paid up members and activists within it. The surrealist attachment to communism, while it may seem a little odd now, made perfect sense at the time. And it was also another way in which to wind up bourgeois opinion. As the political scene became more polarized and political issues more urgent through the later 20s and into the 1930s, surrealism became more explicitly politically committed. You can see this in the change in the names of journals. So the first Surrealist magazine was called The Surrealist Revolution. The second, this one, is called Surrealism at the Service of the Revolution. Quite a different matter. At the same time, contradictions and tensions began to open up between the demands of political discipline, collective action, and especially the demands of the Communist Party following the line of the Soviet Union and the ideals of the freedom of the imagination, the freedom of the mind. Juan Miro was not constitutionally uh, a very political artist. Miro was much more interested in the personal freedom aspect of surrealism. Mainstream cultural and political opinion in France at that time. At its centre was focused on the idea that France could be both a modern nation, but also one that held on to its traditional values and to some extent its classically inflected culture. And there were two kinds of artistic response to that, um, uh, other than that which merely went along with it. And one was a sort of hyper-rational, hyper-modern, technophile version seen in the work of Fernand Leger or Le Corbusier, 
which says, no, we don't need those classical values anymore. We can push onwards towards uh, a truly modern, truly technocratic, truly technological state. And on the other side, there was the surrealists who were truly dissident and who said, we, don't, we want nothing of this. Right? We, we want nothing of that kind of high culture and we want nothing of those sorts of technological innovations either. In a sense, it's an avant-garde movement, but it's an anti-modernist movement, and that makes it rather fascinating, but also quite marginal. And certainly, the idea that there would be a serious alliance with the Communist Party, which of course uh, is a strongly rationalizing and modernizing organization, um, that was never really gonna happen. <laughs>